I find it very interesting to think about the twists life takes us in. You see, in my former days, I was a philosopher. Certainly not what you would consider a man of action, and yet I find myself here now in Wolfstack Docks, looking at a ship that I'm the captain of. To anyone reading this now, my reasons for acquiring the vessel will no doubt seem very cliché, but I assure you they meant a great deal to me. You see, I never knew who my father was. I never got a chance to meet the man the Unterzee claimed him very long ago, but I often wondered what happened to him. Previously, I believed I had no chance of ever finding his remains because there were simply no leads to follow. However, the Gracious Widow provided me with a lead. I knew about the Gracious Widow via reputation, of course, long before I had met her. Many rumors circulated around her. It was speculated that she controlled half the crime in London. However, it was also speculated that she was 500 years old, so who could say for certain? After a while, I was able to come into contact with the Gracious Widow and arranged a meeting with her. She received me in utter darkness, no doubt to obscure her identity from me. However, I was very surprised by how youthful her voice sounded when she spoke to me. The widow informed me that she did have an interest in my father. She hoped news of the headstone would bring someone out of hiding, which of course it did, or I wouldn't be here now. I was very happy to finally have a lead on what may have happened to my father in the Untersee, and as such, I set about acquiring a ship as soon as possible so that I could set sail for Port Cecil. As we were preparing to cast off from fallen London, a tomb colonist approached me. You see, it's very hard to die in fallen London, but when Londoners become too wretched and tattered to live, they wrap themselves up in bandages and set sail for the tomb colonies. This man was one such tomb colonist and he requested that I ferry him to Venderbright. I consulted with the crew and asked them if they knew where Venderbright was, indeed several had heard of the wretched place and told me that it was not too far north of fallen London. Content in the knowledge that it was not too far out of the way, and promised a reward at the end of the journey, I agreed to the man's request. It took a certain amount of heavy lifting to get him on board, because tomb colonists, you see, they prefer to travel in padded coffins. They sleep the entire journey, and then are awoken on the other end. The hull began to rumble as the engines fired up for the first time. I was apprehensive about this endeavor, but it was something that I must do. The propellers churned, moving us forward. As the Z-Air began to whip past me, I reached into my pocket and pulled out some Z-Sickness pills. There was no horizon to look at, but the waters were relatively calm, due to us being in a giant cave. What a miserable place. Some ways into the journey, one of the men brought up a small cage on the deck and opened the hatch. With a flurry of movement, a brown... thing flew out and into the darkness. I asked the man, holding the cage, what on earth was that? The Zailer looked at me with ridicule in his eye. That was a Z-Bat, sir. We let him loose, and if they come back with nothing on him, it means there's no land about our ship. Through his odd grammar, I understood what he meant. I had heard of overland sea captains using birds for similar purposes. But bats? It just felt a little bit off. The spotlights bore forward into the darkness and found something. It was a massive wall going north, Venderbright. We had to turn and mount starboard to continue on, and weaved our way through a small channel. Our helmsman continued along, following the wall to lead us to Vendor Wright's harbor. The smell wafting off the city was of terrible magnitude. I brought out my handkerchief and brought it to my face. This would be a long stop. Once we finished docking in Vendor Bright Harbor, I instructed the crew to bring the tomb colonist up on deck and release him from the coffin. I personally found Venderbright to be the most appalling thing I had ever laid eyes on to this day, but the tomb colonist seemed to have his breath taken away by the sight of it. Breathlessly, he told me it was everything he had ever imagined, but then he told me that something was missing from the place and that he had a request for me. The tomb colonist informed me that he wanted me to find someone. She had gone off to Mangrove College, he said, said she needed to get out of London, but Venderbright is just as safe as the college and that she'd be bored of where she is now. I consulted the Zailers and asked them if they knew where Mangrove College was. One such man had heard of the place, but had never been there himself. He told me it was in the south of the Untersee, but other than that, he couldn't say. The tomb colonist thanked me for ferrying him to Venderbright and wished me luck in the search, before disappearing off into the dark alleys of the tomb colony. And then we found ourselves there, standing on the deck looking out at the tomb colony of Venderbright. Even on the deck, we could hear the sound of a thousand bandaged dead as they shuffled about and coughed. It was something like the world's most restless concert audience, or the world's most plague-ridden cathedral. 
The Zaylers and I found it to be a surreal experience to explore the streets of Vanderbright. They were dark, covered in cobwebs, and the colonists themselves often stood still enough to be mistaken for sculptures, until they broke out into laughing or coughing fits, that is. We encountered several curios during our trip. One such thing was a jeweled wooden snake we located in a tree. One Zaylor claimed that it would fetch a fine price on a bazaar, which I didn't doubt very much. Another claimed that it had a cursy look. I had initially dismissed the Zaylor as being superstitious, but I must confess that after I had placed it on my shelf next to my antique sextant, I found its gaze to be very unnerving, and I have taken to covering it with a hat so its eyes no longer follow me. There was one matter I still wished to attend to in Renderbright, and that was a meeting with the first curator. The first curator, you see, is in charge of the preservation of the tomb colonies, and has been around longer than fallen London itself has, as many of the older tomb colonists have. However, all tomb colonists dissolve eventually, and after meeting with the first curator, I could tell that this one's time was near. It was a very curious meeting I had with the first curator, one I'd rather not spend too much time remembering, if at all possible. I met them in darkness, for you see they were terribly afraid of moths, and I was instructed to bring no light with me for that reason. It had laid there, on the couch, barely larger than a child, and spoke in a very low, rasping voice. I had some questions for the first curator about the nature of the tomb colonies, though the curator assured me at every turn I simply did not want to know about what exactly happened here. Sometime into the meeting, the curator ushered me closer to it and asked that I fulfill a request. The first curator informed me that it thirsted for colors, whatever that meant, before collapsing onto the couch and no longer having the energy to even speak with me. At that point, the audience was over and I was ushered outside by the steward. The steward, upon ushering me outside, gave me a slim book and informed me that the first curator was very old indeed and that it would be very grateful if I could fulfill this request. With everything tended to in the tomb colonies and a few more requests picked up for good measure, we set about preparing to leave the wretched port. Our ship started out from the dying city back the way we came, however, we were not going back to fallen London immediately. Instead, I instructed the helmsman to take us to a location we had passed on our way here, an island by the name of Hunter's Keep. I had seen the name on the map, and I knew I must go see who lives there, for the name sparked a question in my mind. What kind of hunting did they do down there? In our approach to the island, the hairs on the back of my neck began to rise up. The air seemed to tremble. A breath of change passed. I was starting to regret my choice of destination. Hunter's Keep itself was a hump of dark rock, swathed in mist like a hundred other Unterzee islands. But upon this one laid a grand house, windows aglow, lawns impossibly green and lush in the fall starlight. I stood upon the dock as the sea nudged the ship's sides. An unexpectedly warm breeze carried the faintest trace of lavender. I admit that in the moment I may have forgotten my manners and let curiosity get the better of me, for you see I did not immediately go up and knock upon the door to see who lived here. I instead felt the strange compulsion to sneak up upon a window and look inside. Within the room I saw three women, a dark-haired girl bent over a piano keyboard, another fair-haired but unmistakably the other's sister sprawled out on the sofa with a book, and a third sat by a fireplace, staring sorrowfully into the embers. A log popped, and the woman by the fire was given a violent start, and I must admit I could not restrain a start of my own, which somewhat gave me away as I locked eyes with the woman by the fireplace. At this point, there were very few options left to me, and all I could truly do was step apologetically into the room and ask forgiveness. The eldest introduced herself as Cynthia and introduced her other sisters, claiming the noisy one was Phoebe and the cheerful one was Lucy. I was very surprised once we had gotten all of the introductions out of the way, because it was at this point these sisters actually invited me to have lunch with them. Not all of the sisters, as one of them claimed to have other matters to attend to, so I instead would only have lunch with Cynthia and Lucy. Once we sat down for lunch, both the sisters had their own tales to spin for me. Cynthia, the more melancholy of the two, had spun me a tale about a murder, an axe, a net, and blood-scented water. Lucy spanned me quite a different tale, one that involved a pig and a vicar. I must admit that I could not follow all the details, as it was terribly convoluted. After some time, Cynthia noticed that I was not really eating my lunch, and that was because I found the situation slightly uncomfortable. She then asked me if I wanted another chop. I must confess I was not sure what she meant and politely declined. She then informed me she would have the maid wrap up my meal so that I could take it with me, telling me that it was not safe to be hungry. 
I would normally say it's nice having the company of non-sailors once in a while, but the ladies of Hunter's Keep have made me choose never to come back. There was most certainly something unnatural about them, and it seemed while I conversed with them I could feel a large gaze upon me, as if something bigger than men were watching. At the time, I merely chalked it up to my first days at Z, but now that I am back on the boat, I still feel those eyes watching. <laughs>